for, much in keeping with the message today, his eye is on the sparrow, the message is more valuable than many sparrows, number 624, and we'll sing all the verses. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus says, my portion, my constant friend is he. mentioned to me a moment ago that uh, he had forgotten one of the announcements. Immediately after the service today, there is a luncheon over in the fellowship hall. Now, all the young people from the other churches in the presbytery, of course, are going to head over there. So if you want to meet them, you'll want to go over there for lunch. But he also said that uh, if you would like to help defray the costs, if you would see Sandy Walker, she's around here somewhere. Where's Sandy? She's coming. Okay. <laughs> Be sure to see Sandy Walker whenever she appears. And um, you could like to help with maybe $5. That would be a great help. All right. Let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 10. The message today is entitled, More Valuable 
than many sparrows. And that's not just because of weight. I mean, if you weigh 200 pounds, like, well, I won't mention the names of some of the youth leaders that might weigh that much, but um, how many sparrows would it take to make up that much weight? I think it'd be quite a few sparrows. But what if you had a few more sparrows than what that particular youth group leader weighed? Would then the sparrows be worth more than the youth group leader? And all the young people said, oh, come on, amen. <laughs> no, you know that wouldn't be true. The sparrows that Jesus is talking about are very precious in the sight of God, but people are more precious than sparrows. Do you know why? Do you know what makes you valuable in the sight of God? Do you know the things that God has said about you that make you more valuable? Today we're going to talk about some very small birds. But you know, God likes to use very small things in some very big ways. Compared to the universe, you and I are very, very small, but God can use you in a very big way. Stop and think about how large the universe is. The known universe. What's on the other side of the known universe? How far does that stretch out? How far does that go? How big is planet Earth? Compared to our sun, you could hollow planet Earth out and put a hundred thousand excuse me, hollow the sun out, not the earth, hollow the planet, the sun out, and put a hundred planet Earths inside the sun, a hundred thousand of them, and they'd rattle around. The universe is huge. And yet, God looks down here and he sees you, where you're sitting this morning, in that pew. You are infinitesimally small compared to the universe. But God also looks down and he looks outside here and he sees some sparrows. And he cares about sparrows. It says so in our text. But you're a lot more valuable than many sparrows. Why does God love you? As you look at yourself, is there anything about you that's lovely? Oh, the girls say, well, I, I comb my hair real pretty. Is that why God loves you? I put on my lipstick this morning. Is that why God loves you? You're a guy, you say, I work out with weights every day. I can press all of 32 pounds. Is that why God loves you? Why are you more valuable than sparrows? Petta would say that you weren't. People for the ethical treatment of animals. They say you're just as about the same value. In fact, human beings are, in the eyes of some people on earth, they're worse than the animals. They, those folks want to get rid of people so that the animals can come back. Why are you more valuable than animals? Do you know why? Did you know that God cares about you? Right where you're sitting. Rich or poor, old or young, tall or short, fat or skinny, handsome or ugly, I don't know, everybody's, right now, young people are running through their minds, yeah, I know some really ugly girls. Ooh, man. <laughs> Be careful, you're talking about one of God's sparrows. Some of you girls are, you know, twittering around thinking to yourself, <laughs> ooh, that's really a nice guy over there. But that one over there, oh, what a dog. And I know that's how you talk. And I know that's what happens when you get together in groups groups of girls who look across the room and see a guy over there and he's sort of blushing and embarrassed and he's got a pimple or two and so you're making jokes about it. Or you guys, you get together and you look across the room and you see some girl over there who's sort of homely. She's way too tall or maybe she's way too short. So you make comments about her. Be careful. You're talking about one of God's sparrows. And God loves her. And God loves him. Sparrows. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? You 
It doesn't say without your father's knowledge. It says one will not fall on the ground without your father. That means God is in control of every sparrow and every other bird worldwide the exact moment of their death. And somehow within God's sovereign plan in all of the universe as he has spread it out, he has determined what will ultimately bring him the greatest amount of glory and the greatest good for his people. Not a sparrow falls without your father. God has ordained a cat to catch that sparrow. God has ordained that sparrow as a baby nestling to fall out of its nest and starve. God has ordained that sparrow to die of old age. Is there injustice with God in doing that kind of thing? And then he compares you to sparrows. And he says, you're much more valuable than many sparrows. Do you not think that he cares about you if he cares that much about a little bird? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I wonder if we could count the hairs on everybody's head in the entire world and the number of sparrows, how it compare. You know, that's not the comparison Jesus is making. He's telling you that the most insignificant things are things that are important to him. They may not be important to you. You may not think of them as highly and as significantly as other things. We tend to overlook our sins that way, don't we? Oh, it's insignificant. It's, it's not that valuable. It's not that important. If God has the hair on your head numbered, do you not think that he watches when you commit sin? You say, it's a little one. How big is a hair? It's a little one. You see, God is not just concerned about little things or big things. He's concerned about the little things in our lives, too. We are very small compared to the universe, but you know God can use small things in a very big way. Over the past several weeks, those who are regular here have been studying the ten very nasty plagues of Egypt. And one of the great truths that we have been learning, in fact, that stands out, is that God is highly interested in little things, not just big things. Little things that get our attention. So far we've looked at blood and frogs and lice and flies and boils and murrain, which is sort of like mad cow disease. The tiny little parts of the blood are incredibly complex, with literally thousands of things occurring every second in every blood cell in your body. Frogs are small, but they can be incredibly poisonous. Lice are obviously tiny, but they can be horrifying vectors for disease. Our God is big. Those things are little. Our God is infinite. But God uses little things in two very special categories. He uses little things for judgment to show us that we are not big. But God also uses little things like the sparrows of our text today to show his infinite kindness, his wisdom, his sovereign plan. His loving care. Now, those of you who are with us every week, you'll have to bear with me for a second, but I want these young people to understand the contrast that I'm going to make. I'm not going to preach all those sermons that I did over the last 15 weeks, but I'm going to give a summary of some of the facts about the little things that we've studied, because that will help us to understand why sparrows and why each one of these young people is so special in the sight of God. Let me talk about the little things for just a second we've looked at. Did you know that there are over 3,000 species of mice? Some are fat, some are skinny, some are pale colored, some are dark colored, some are hairy, some are bald, just like people. There are two types of lice, the sucking type and the chewing type. They are classified as human disease agents. They affect every type of bird and mammal except the platypus, the spiny anteater, bats, whales, dolphins, porpoises, and pangolins, which is a scaly anteater that can climb trees. 
That means that sparrows have lice, too. You may have seen some. I bet you wondered how I was going to get lice together with sparrows, but there it is. Lice are scavengers. They feed on skin and debris found on the host body. Some animals carry as many as 15 different species of lice. If you have lice, it reduces your life expectancy. Lice are one of the principal causes of epidemic typhus. Some of you are into World War II and the Nazis. Pictures of the liberation of the Nazi Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in April of 1945 show thousands of mass graves of Jews who were killed by typhus, not merely by the Nazis. Typhus killed Anne Frank, age 15. She was the age of some of you guys out here. It killed her sister Margot, age 19, at this camp, just a month before the liberation by the Allied forces. Without treatment, death occurs in up to 60% of patients with epidemic typhus. In the Spanish siege of Moorish Granada in 1489, the Spaniards lost 3,000 men to enemy action, but they lost an additional 17,000 men to typhus. During Napoleon's retreat from Moscow in 1812, more French soldiers died of typhus than were killed by Russians. They had a lice problem in the army. 100,000 Irish died of typhus between 1816 and 1819. In the U.S., typhus epidemic killed the son of President Franklin Pierce. It struck Philadelphia in 1837. Other epidemics occurred in Baltimore and Memphis and Washington, D.C. between 1865 and 1973. It's not long ago, guys. Let me talk about flies for just a second. I'm talking about little things, remember? God uses some for judgment. God uses some for blessing. Flies. You thought there were a lot of different kinds of lice? 3,000 different kinds of lice. Not 3,000 lice, 3,000 different kinds of lice. Just like different kinds of dogs, you know. A poodle is not the same thing as a Great Dane. A Pomeranian is not the same thing as a German Shepherd. 3,000 kinds of lice. Did you know there are over 240,000 different kinds of flies in the world? And only half of those, 120,000 of them, have been scientifically categorized and studied in detail. Want a job for the rest of your life? How would you like to go study a fly for the rest of your life? One that nobody has ever studied before. Sound exciting? There are people that do that, folks. What's it tell us? That tells us that God is infinitely creative. Not merely in the big things, but in the little things. In the plague of flies, he predetermined, in fact, the precise hatching date for billions and billions and billions of flies. And not one of them went into Goshen where the children of Israel were. Do we have a God who is sovereign? Do we have a God who cares about little things? Do we have a God who can guarantee that one fly will not fly from Pharaoh's presence across the border into Goshen where the Jews lived? Do we have a God who is in control? even when we don't like what he's doing. I bet some of you here have had experiences that you said, God, why did you do that to me? Do you not know that there is a God who loves you, wants to wake you up, wants you to understand your lost and sinful condition, wants you to understand that it's going to be a lot worse than that in hell. It's time to get right with Christ now. Not tomorrow, not next week, now. You wish you could be dating a certain guy. You wish you could be dating a certain girl. You wish you could, you, could, you could have these friends over there that have sort of shunned you out of their group and you wanted to be in the cool group. You know that God is developing in you the character of Christ. He's teaching you that this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Do you understand that what he's teaching you is the things that are important are the eternal things. That you should set your affection on things which are above, not on things which are on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Therefore mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, covetousness, all those awful things that are listed as sins. God uses the tough things in life to conform you to the image of Christ. Flies. God cares about the little things and he cares about the little sins that you shrug off and say it doesn't matter. Now you're probably thinking, so how's that crazy preacher going to tie flies? The birds. Do birds have flies? No. Did you listen to the text? It's a fair question to ask. As I read through the text, did you pick up on it? Those of you who have been here for weeks and weeks should have picked up on something that's in the immediate context of the sparrows. 
that relates to flies. Did you pick up on it? In that context, Jesus is talking about the horrifying subject of Beelzebub. Beelzebub, Baalzevim, means Lord of the Flies. You've heard that phrase, haven't you? The Lord of the Flies. Jesus said that Beelzebub was the devil, Satan himself. That is within three verses of where our text is today about the sparrows. Verse 24 and 25, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as he be as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? That's just three verses before our text about the sparrows. Now, I hope that's beginning to make you a little bit curious about why in the world did Jesus talk about sparrows in the middle of a speech about sheep and wolves and snakes and doves and big family fights and parents and kids killing each other and jail time and the devil and persecution and murder? And in the middle of all that, we got three verses about sparrows? I mean, did Jesus lose it here? I mean, is Jesus changing the subject and then flipping back to where he started? I don't think so. As I pointed out as I was reading the text, he ends exactly with the things that he talked about at the very first part of that passage. Do you ever bother to study your Bible that way? Say, wow, how does this, this particular narrative here, how does the first part relate to the last part? What's going on in the middle? How do I get from point one to point 15 down here? What happened in between to get me to that point? Dear people, you will see the most incredible riches as you begin to study your Bibles that way. As instead of just reading through them, you stop and ask questions. Why did Jesus just say that? Why did you just say this about, about the sparrows? With that question in mind, let me pick up the other short passage in Luke where Jesus also talks about sparrows. It's Luke chapter 12. I'll start reading in verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Be ye ware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. All those little whispering knots of girls and guys. How would you like it if suddenly you were dragged out of the group, put in the center of the ring, your feet chained to the floor so you couldn't run away, your hands chained to your side so you couldn't put them over your nose and mouth, and eyes, and then an announcement is made. All right, everybody, listen up. And over the loudspeaker comes your voice saying whatever catty, ugly thing you just said about some other person in the group. And everybody else is standing around going, <laughs> they're snickering at you. Do you think you might change the way you talk? Matthew 12, 31. Two chapters after this, and in a chapter where Beelzebub is also discussed, our Lord Jesus Christ says, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word. Folks, how glad we are that God loves us. Every one of us has thought and said and done and had motives that were evil and that should have sent us to hell. No exceptions, every one of us. But there's a God who loves even little sparrows and loves you a lot more than the little sparrows. He goes on. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. That's the people around you, the ones that you're always, you know, scared of, the ones that you're always worried about, what do they think about you? 
I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And that is not the devil, that is God. The devil doesn't have power to cast you into hell. Only God does. The devil himself is going to be a resident of hell because God is going to cast him into hell. The one we need to learn to fear is the Lord. The fear of the Lord, says the book of Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Do you have the fear of the Lord or do you sort of smirk when holy things are talked about and you just sort of tolerate it? It means that you are not wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not all wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 4, 7. Then we have our verses. This is immediately after the verse that says, Fear him which hath killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not ye, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. That's what follows that. Also I say unto you, next verse, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. We're suddenly moving from sparrows to blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. We're suddenly moving from sparrows to the unpardonable sin. Do you know why God stuck those two verses in Luke and three verses in Matthew? And when they bring you into the synagogues and before the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what things you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Now, I'm not going to spend time on this, but I just want to say very quickly, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, we talked about that five or six weeks ago here. What is it? The unpardonable sin. What is it? And why is it in the context of us as little sparrows? So for those of you who weren't with us, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is not the sin of unbelief because unbelief switches to belief at the moment that a person trusts in Christ for salvation. Until that happens, it's unpardoned, but it's not unpardonable. Mark defines the unpardonable sin in Mark chapter 3, verses 28 through 30, in the context of people who saw Jesus perform a miracle and then said that Jesus worked his miracles in the power of the devil. In other words, they called the power of the Holy Spirit the power of Satan when they saw Jesus do a miracle. Mark chapter 3, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men. All sins, all of them except this one. All blasphemies whereby they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because, now here he explains it. Of all the Gospels, Mark is the only one who explains it. Because they said, he, that is Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. Remember, he just cast out some demons. And so the scribes and Pharisees knew that there was a supernatural power involved here. And they thought there are only two that are possible. There's God and the devil. We don't want to admit it to God that did that because, you know, we're fighting against Jesus. So we've got to say it was the devil that did it. Because they said, he, that is Jesus, has an unclean spirit. They said, by Beelzebub he casts out the demons. You can't do the unpardonable sin. You can't see Jesus performing miracles. Now let's answer the question, why does Jesus in thir three verses in Matthew and two verses in Luke about sparrows, when the principal thrust of the entire passage is about suffering and persecution and death? Think carefully. Jesus is weaving a very tight argument to strengthen and to encourage some very feeble and shaky disciples so that not only will they know what is coming, but they will know how they ought to handle it. Yesterday, Reverend Coleman gave you all kinds of interesting facts about birds in general. He told you that the general estimate for the number of birds currently in the world is 100 billion birds of all different types. The United States has only a small percentage of those birds with about 5 billion living in the U.S. Uh, the rest of those birds that don't live in the U.S. haven't been able to get their passports yet. There are 212 families of birds, ranging all the way from flightless kiwi birds and ostriches and emus and the extinct elegant elephant bird 
to tiny hummingbirds, giant raptors like the great American bald eagle and so on. Within those 212 families of birds, there are about 12,000 species, 30,000 subspecies. So there are more kinds of birds than there are kinds of lice. But birds aren't even close to having the number of different kinds of birds that there are kinds of flies. In the United States alone, there are 30 different subfamilies of sparrows. 30 subfamilies of sparrows. And many more subfamilies worldwide. There are sparrows in the weaver bird family. There are sparrows in the finch family. There are midge sparrows and grasshopper sparrows and savanna sparrows and American sparrows. And each one of these subspecies has up to 16 further subspecies. A lot of sparrows. God's very creative. God's infinitely creative, even with sparrows. You know what? He's infinitely creative with people. There are no two of you here that look the same. No two of you here that are exactly the same age. No two of you here that are exactly the same weight or height or shape. Your skin pigment is slightly different than the next person. We have a God who delights in infinite variety. What do we know about sparrows? Well, first, they're a well-known kind of bird. They rarely get your attention as you walk down the street because everybody ignores them. When was the last time you walked down the street counting sparrows? I mean, you know, we don't do that, right? I mean, they're just very common. They're very average. They're a very insignificant kind of bird when compared to sparrows. They are very drab. They are a very unbeautiful kind of bird as birds go. They're kind of ugly. You know, he could have talked about these cockatoos, you know, the big frilly heads, or they could talk about, you know, multiple colored parrots. Uh, he didn't. That's not what he compared us to. He compared us to sparrows. They're a relatively worthless kind of bird because they're not good for food or clothing or shelter or economic production of any kind. They're just tolerated rather than being enjoyed like the pretty birds or the songbirds. Most of us want to be pretty birds or songbirds, but most of us are not pretty birds or songbirds. We wish God had made us that way, but we are not content with the way he made us. But it's so that we can understand that our value to him, our worth to him, is not based on how talented we are, how gifted we are, how rich we are, how beautiful we are, how beautiful of figure and form we are. We're like sparrows. Sparrows come in large flocks. They can ruin a crop. In cities, they leave a mess everywhere they perch. They have big families with multiple broods every year, four to seven age, uh, eggs in every one of those five or six times they lay eggs during the year. They have sassy personalities. They chirp rather than singing like songbirds. Do you begin to understand why Jesus compares us to sparrows? Everything that can be said about their character, the effects on other people, the beauty of sparrows, that can be said about us. Do you sometimes feel like you rarely get attention, that everybody ignores you? Do you feel like you're average and insignificant? Do you feel that you're rather drab and ugly? Do you feel that you're relatively worthless in the eyes of the world and usually you're just being tolerated like sparrows? You know, pagans think we ruin their society just like sparrows can ruin a crop. Pagans look at us like we're making a mess of their fun. And for most homeschoolings, homeschooling families, we have way too many kids with our big families. I can remember after the first kid the Lord gave us, people said, oh, that's really nice. After the second one, they were saying to us, ah, oh, now you've got your family. After the third one, they were beginning to question. After the fourth one, I actually... A doctor's wife came up to my wife and said, my, doc, my uh, husband is a surgeon. He can fix your husband. <laughs> and my wife said to her, he's not broken. <laughs> so, you know, the, the world around us looks like we are weirdos. But if those of you who are in the homeschooling movement know there are lots of families that are big families out there. But that's how the world thinks of Christians. We have sassy personalities. We chirp rather than being beautiful songbirds. But let's think about what our Heavenly Father thinks about us. You know, I learned uh, something a long time ago. I was in early in my high school years, and I tended to have people mock me a lot. They called me H.G. Spencer. That stood for Holy Ghost Spencer. 
They called me the nabi when I got to college. That's the word navi for prophet. Uh, and they were insinuating the false prophet. Um, I, I felt left out quite a bit. But I came to the conclusion, I really don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. That's a good maxim to live by, young people. I really don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. That will keep you from going wrong about 99% of the time. How can you please Christ? The scripture tells us, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. You're only going around once. Make sure you do it right. What does our Heavenly Father think? Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? You know, there's, there's a bulk purchase there. You can get uh, two for one, but you can get five for two. That's a bargain deal. That's the Luke passage. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question, what makes something valuable? How come? Why are you valuable? Why is a price of a farthing for two sparrows or two farthings for five sparrows, why is that price set as it is? Let me put it this way. Why is a Rolls Royce more valuable than a Ford Pinto? Why is steak more valuable than a bean burrito? Why is a diamond ring more valuable than a plastic bubblegum ring? Or why, for that matter, is a $10 bill more valuable than a $1 bill? Since they're both the same size, they're printed on the same kind of special paper, and they're printed with green ink. Why is one more valuable than the other one? Well, put on your thinking caps. Let's think about it for a second. Independ ind individually, and then we'll, we'll think about it as a collective group. Why is it that way? Well, starters, the Rolls-Royce will probably have fewer mechanical problems than the Ford Pinto, so it's more reliable. The steak will make you strong, and the bean burrito will probably give you gas. For endurance, a diamond ring is less easily broken than a plastic bubblegum ring, and with paper money, hey, well, we all like pieces of paper with bigger numbers on them, right? But now let's suppose that we live in a society where walking was the most highly prized form of transportation. And so having a broken car was a status symbol because it would not tempt you to ride instead of walk. Suddenly the pinto takes on value. Suppose you lived in a world where the most highly prized possession was methane gas. Bean burritos just trumped the stakes. What if in this make-believe world everybody hated things that were hard and shiny, where the most valuable things were soft and mushy, where the more mushy it was, the more valuable it was? You know what? Bananas would beat diamonds every time. What if you lived in a world where big numbers were scorned because nobody could count above five, or a world where any expression of covetousness immediately landed you in jail breaking rocks with a sledgehammer? Suddenly, $100,000 bills would be a source of terror, not sources of glee. So the question, what makes something valuable? Why are you valuable? I hope you get the point. You see, value is determined by the buyer, not by the seller. If the seller puts a price on an item and nobody buys the item, the seller goes out of business. In economics, this is known as the law of supply and demand. Items that are in high demand keep rising in price so long as there is a demand, and when the demand decreases, the price usually does as well to keep the warehouse stock moving. The buyer determines the value of the item. No matter how much energy or time or resources went into making that item. Did you know that's what redemption is all about? In fact, the Greek word for redeem means to buy something in the agora. The agora was the ancient marketplace, the public market, where buyers and sellers transacted their business. 
It's that root word that's used for the word redemption in the New Testament. You see, at one point, you were for sale. You were for sale on the slave market of sin. Your sin, both that which you received as a sin debt from Adam and your own personal violation of God's standards, had made you into a slave. You were up for sale to the highest bidder. You weren't worth very much to the rest of the world. They were glad to use you and abuse you. They were willing to use you for a while and then throw you away, and some of you have experienced that. But then a real buyer came along, a real buyer who chose to love you. Even though you were dirty and naked and filthy and abused and on the slave auction block, your name come up. He cast his bid. Nobody could match his bid. And he paid something for us that was of infinite value. He bought us with his blood. He bought us off the slave market of sin. His name is Jesus. The reason you're valuable is because you are loved. The reason you're valuable is because God paid for you with an infinitely valuable price. That's why Jesus could say, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus didn't die for the animals and for the birds. Jesus died for people. That's why the animal rights movement is wrong. Recently, an orangutan was given legal standing in court to sue. An orangutan. Animals in Denmark have recently been given legal rights to marry people. People, there's something wrong here. PETA ought not to stand for people for the ethical treatment of animals. It should stand for people eating tasty animals. That's the reason we're much more valuable than many sparrows. Now, why is it placed in that passage in Matthew and Mark? I know my time is up. I'll quit as soon as I can run right through this. Verses 5 through 15, if you look at that passage in Matthew, you can just sort of glance over it as I'm running through some thought here. 5 through 15, you and I have been sent to proclaim the gospel. It's a daunting task in and of itself. Verse 16, you're helpless when you face the kind of people Jesus sends you to witness to. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Point C, you will be arrested, tortured, and you will suffer. That's verses 17 and 18. He says, I'll tell you what to say, verses 19 and 20. But your family and everybody else is going to hate you, and some of them will kill you. That's verses 21 and 22 and 23 and 24. Then verses 25 through 27, they will curse you. If they call Jesus Beelzebub, what are they going to call us? Verse 28, but you don't need to be afraid. Fear not them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. That's all those guys, what they've been doing to you in the first 27 verses of this chapter. And the reason is verses 29 through 31. You don't need to be afraid because your father takes care of the sparrows and he loves you more than sparrows. You're valuable to him. The buyer is the one who determines the value. And Jesus paid an infinite price for you. He loves you. He loves you. Do you know what it means to love someone? To really love them. The pain that you feel when they step into the arms of the one who loves them more in heaven. I'm beginning to understand this just a little. A year ago, my beautiful Lord Jesus took my beautiful Judy home to heaven. And you know what? 
It has caused me to love Jesus more because he loved her and he did what was best for her. You may not understand that, but he loves you just as much. So don't be afraid to witness. That's verses 32 and 33. That's where he started this passage. He said, I'm sending you out there. I want you to go out and trust me to take care of you. You don't have to carry all this stuff with you. Trust me, I'll take care of you. He ends there. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. He had talked to them about witnessing. Remember at the first part of this passage? Him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, the stakes are high, folks, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. You see, suffering tends to make us shut up. Persecution and beatings and scourgings and possibly death tends to make us back off from our Christian witness and testimony. That's why Jesus told us about the sparrows. You are more valuable than many sparrows, and not one sparrow in the history of the world has fallen without your father's hand at work in taking that little sparrow out. Fear not ye therefore, for ye are of much greater value than many sparrows. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your love, for your mercy. We don't understand all the things that happen in life. And yet, we trust you. We trust you because you've proved that you love us. We were nasty, rotten, vile, stinking, diseased, filthy, naked slaves on the slave market. And you chose to love us. And you bid the highest price possible. And no one could outbid you. And you agarazzoed us. You bought us with the blood of Jesus. If you paid such a price, will you not with him also freely give us all things? Father, teach us to love you so that we might respond properly with a love that reflects the love of Jesus. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.